of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name lo Hamah, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Now when she had weaned lo Ruhamah, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name lo Ammi, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. That is a very stunning declaration. God got to the point where their sin had caused him to say this, I am no longer your God, you are no longer my people. And uh, we'll, we'll go on. The Bible says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Father, thank you for giving us this time to study your book. And Lord, our attention is now turned to the book of Hosea. And Lord, uh, we read many things in here that are, that are interesting and, and, and mysterious to us. And Lord, we just pray that, Lord, you'd give us insight to your word. Uh, the, the psalmist said, the entrance of thy word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Lord, we come before you tonight and, and admit we are a simple people. And we need, we need your word to enter into our hearts tonight so we can understand better and more fully the things that you have revealed to us in the word of God. I pray that, Lord, you'd be glorified in all that's said and done tonight. Please, Lord, uh, that you'd order my thoughts and loosen my lips so that I might, first of all, bring honor and glory to your name and please you. And secondly, Lord, that I might be a help and encouragement to your people. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Very interesting book we have set before us, even the first chapter, the commandment, the word of God that came to Hosea when he told him to go and take a, I, I can use a little more gentle word, a harlot, uh, maybe a a. a prostitute might be a word we might use and again not trying to be uh, titillating in any way shape or form or provocative in any way shape or form but that's what God said go take the wife of whoredoms go take a, a woman that's engaged in that uh, illicit activity and take her for a wife and well it sounds strange God God commanding one of his men to do that uh, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you know, we're called to be holy and like God is holy. And we understand that uh, uh, his prophets were, 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 were ordained and, and prepared for special ministry. Yet here we see uh, Hosea given a, a very strange command to go and do this. And God certainly had his reasons, but uh, and very interesting illustration that God uses here. And so we're going to take a look at the imagery uh, that, that, that's behind uh, or that's out in front of the command that God gave uh, Hosea in just a moment. But I want to take you through just a little overview of Hosea. I find these things fascinating and I hope you don't find them boring, but it's neat to get some information, some background on the books we read. And certainly uh, the background of the book of Hosea is very important for us. Obviously the writer of the book of Hosea is the man Hosea. Uh, his name means salvation. And that's what God is all about. He's interested in the salvation of his people. Uh, and again, he's interested in the salvation of you and I. And that's why he sent Jesus Christ into the world and called his name Jesus. Uh, and his name is called Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin. My friend, the work of salvation is the greatest work anybody can enter into as we introduce sinners to the Savior. I uh, was talking with... Um I was just trying to figure out who I was talking to. I was talking to a lot of people, amen, uh, lately. Uh, but we were, we were, we were uh, both mentioning this uh, uh, in, in unison. The greatest thing that any Christian can ever do is introduce somebody to the Savior. That is, that is the most important, the greatest thing, because that is eternal, amen. As we uh, attempt to tell others and share our faith uh, with, with them about the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that is the most important thing that we can ever be engaged in, the winning of souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so his name means salvation. It just uh, identifies for us God's desire toward the world, amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, amen. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Salvation is a great work of God, amen. So the name Hosea means salvation. Salvation. Now, the date of the writing, uh, it, it, it takes place between the years 788 and 723 B.C. Uh, so that gives us a little frame of reference there uh, on, the, on the timeline when he wrote. Uh, this would make Hosea uh, a contemporary of Amos as a prophet to Israel. That's who he was prophesying to, the ten northern tribes uh, called Israel in the Bible. When the civil war broke out between uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, uh, 
uh, Jeroboam took the ten northern kingdoms and they split off and Rehoboam, uh, uh, the, the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin remained loyal to him. And so they split. Uh, the ten northern tribes that, uh, that elected King Jeroboam uh, became known as Israel and the two southern uh, tribes became known as Judah. And that's how they were in the divided kingdom stage of the nation of Israel's history. And so uh, uh, Amos, both Amos and Hosea, uh, prophesied to Israel the northern kingdom. So they were both contemporaries there. And Hosea was not only a contemporary to Amos in the north, but he's also a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah, who were prophets to Judah in the southern kingdom. So they all preached around the same time. So when you see them in the Bible, they were prophesying to the people at the same time. And so God was not left without a witness in either kingdom uh, during, during these times. Now, what was the scope of this book that we're looking at and going to be studying for the next several weeks? Well, the scope were the prophecies, uh, really, to the northern kingdom of Israel. We're going to see some mentions of, of Judah. We even saw a mention tonight um, uh, in uh, uh, verse number 7, but I'll have mercy upon the house of Judah, uh, talking about the reign of Hezekiah there, where they were not delivered by their armies because uh, they were surrounded completely by the Assyrians. And Rabshakeh, remember Rabshakeh came up and said, I'll set you 20,000 horses if you've got enough guys to sit on them, then we'll come out and do battle. But he knew Hezekiah did not have that big of an army, amen? And uh, Rabshakeh made the mistake of bringing God into the fight, didn't he, amen? Uh, who's your God that's able to deliver you? There's no God that's been able to stand before us the whole way. And when you provoke God, you're blowing smoke in God's face, it's only a matter of time before God uh, cleans the table, amen, and, and, and levels the field. That's, that's what God does. And I'm watching people blow smoke at God. I'm watching people puff up at God. And it's only a matter of time before God just sets things straight and, and, and really just kind of, like I said, uh, humbles uh, the arrogant and the conceited and the... Uh, and, and, and the proud. And so uh, he did that uh, for Hezekiah, and, and, and that prophecy came true. They weren't delivered uh, by any of their own weapons. Amen. Uh, God sent two angels down. They slew 185,000 Assyrians that night. Amen. And when they got up in the morning, <laughs> the Assyrian army was wiped out around there, and those were left fled. Amen. And so it was not a very good day for the Assy to be an Assyrian in the army. When it looked like victory was certain, uh, they were wiped out by just two angels of the Lord. And what an incredible victory that was. So uh, again, his prophecy was primarily the northern kingdom, but he does mentioned the southern kingdom as well at, at several points, but he, he wasn't prophesying to them and not preaching to them. He was preaching to the ten northern tribes. So uh, he was uh, uh, sent to, 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 to prophesy to them. Now, in, in this book, we'll see that uh, uh, Hosea uh, was used to rebuke them for their many sins and their unfaithfulness to their God. Let me just say this, my friend, we cannot afford to be unfaithful to our God. And, uh, uh, and so that unfaithfulness is something that is not something that's just particular to the ten northern tribes. That's something that we've got to uh, protect ourselves against and, and, and fight against. We're not unfaithful to our God either. Amen? Let me just say, in this day and age, that is, that is a rampant sin. Unfaithfulness to God is a very rampant sin. So these words of Hosea that he's delivering to, to Israel uh, should, should, should ring true in our day and age as well. Uh, not only does he rebuke them for their many sins and unfaithfulness to their God, he urges them to repent. He ur urges them to, to see the error of their ways and to return. That's been God's cry, amen? Uh, uh, that was the message that Jonah gave to the Ninevites, wasn't it? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He wanted them to repent. God wanted them to repent. That's what God, God wants every man to, uh, uh, us all to repent. And he sends out that call to repentance. That was John the Baptist's message. That was Jesus Christ's message when he started preaching was repent. And that ought to be the message from the pulpits today. And that ought to be the message of the soul winners as we go out and, and go after the souls of men, women, and children repent. Why? Uh, because God will, God will save if we'll come to him. Amen? We'll turn from our sins and come to him. So uh, he urges them to repentance in this book. He warns them of coming punishment and destruction. His children's names, the names that he gave to his children were were. were, were were billboards, if you want. They were walking billboards. Every time they said that name, that was just, this is coming down the pike. This is what God's got in store for you if you don't repent. And so, uh, again, uh, uh, warning them of the coming punishment and destruction. And then also, uh, his message also had a, 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 a tinge of comforting them concerning the promise of the Messiah and the latter days when they would be returned. We even saw this here in verse number 11. Uh, then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head. Who do you think that one head's going to be? Jesus Christ, amen, when he comes back uh, on, on his white uh, horse, amen, the sword of the Lord coming out of his mouth, amen, and lays to waste uh, uh, the Antichrist and his armies at the Battle of Armageddon, or the battles of Armageddon, we should say, as he lays, uh, lays them waste and delivers Israel, uh, they will look upon him whom they've pierced, amen, and realize he was, he was indeed the Messiah, amen, and they, then he will sit on the throne of his father David, Israel, Judah and Israel will be gathered together, and he will be their head finally and completely and eternally. That's going to be a great day, amen? 
Uh, that's at least, uh, at least seven years out, amen? Uh, but uh, that'll be a great day when Jesus Christ is coronated king, amen, by his people as he sits down on the throne uh, of his father David in Jerusalem. Let me just say this. That is why the world hates Israel. Because... Because the devil knows, and that's why they try to discredit Israel. That's why the, the nation of Israel does not appear on the maps of the Muslim countries. That's why the UN does not recognize them like they should. Because, they, because the devil knows, and he's got the governments of the world in the palm of his hand. He knows that. And so guess what? He wants to do everything and anything he can to eliminate Israel. That's why, that's why the, 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 the nuclear agreement with Iran. He's hoping that he can slip one by God, amen, and, 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 and decimate and completely destroy, annihilate Israel, and then God will have no people. The devil's always been trying to destroy God's people. Even think about this in the book of Esther. What was Haman's plan? He got, a, he got a letter from the king, amen, to destroy every Jew, wherever they may be found by any means possible. That, the devil it telegraphs his punches sometimes, amen. And that's why you have, uh, you have Iran with uh, uh, the, the fast track to the nuclear weapons. And that's why you see, I was just amazed that Cuba put troops down in, in Syria this past week. It's incredible. All the, all the little satellite states of communist Russia are coming together and they're, they're putting troops on the ground, amen. And we put some on the ground and we're trying to... I'm sorry, I'm not going to get political tonight. But again, Israel is, that's where Jesus Christ, this prophecy will be literally fulfilled. We'll be able to look back on Hosea uh, chapter 1, verse 11 and say, this was prophesied uh, uh, some 800 years before Jesus Christ was even born and being fulfilled some several thousand years later. It's going to be an awesome thing, amen, when Jesus Christ comes back. So there's comfort, even in all the warnings, even in all the rebuking, even all the urging to repent, there's still that comfort that's held out to them. Like God, uh, uh, God's going to deal with you for your sin, but God still uh, has a plan for you. Amen. And I say this, when God, when God chastises his children, it's not to destroy them. It, it, it's to better them. It's to build them. It's to, it's to purify them. It's to strengthen them. Not to, not to kill us, but to, but to better us. And, and when we see that, uh, uh, we can see the, the, the comfort that's afforded to them uh, in, in the writings of Hosea. What's the purpose of the book? Uh, if we could uh, uh, distill it down to one single purpose, to show the permanence of God's commands and promises toward His people Israel. Every promise of punishment came true. And every promise of restoration and comfort would also ring, it will also ring true. Amen? So there's a, a permanence of, uh, of these things. When God says it, He does it. The key chapter in the Bible, I chose chapter number 3 uh, because it's where uh, uh, Hosea buys back Gomer. We're going to see that in just a minute. That's where he buys back. So I felt like chapter 3 was that, 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 that important chapter because that's where we see the, the, the grieved husband buying back the, the wayward wife and, and buying her back. And this is God's ultimate plan. So the first three chapters, and we're going to see this in our, uh, our, our book uh, divisions, our, our, our outline... Uh, that the first three chapters really deal with Hosea and Gomer uh, individually, personally like that, as an illustration of God and Israel in the, in the chapters 4 through 14. But I thought chapter 3 uh, being that last chapter, uh, uh, between, uh, really between personally between uh, Hosea and Gomer, uh, where he buys her back, is, is, is such a wonderful chapter. And it's where God's faithfulness and love are powerfully pictured uh, in contrast to Israel's unfaithfulness. Some key verses we might want to look at and keep in mind as we're studying Hosea uh, are found in chapters, uh, chapter number 10, verse 12. Let's take a look there real quickly. Chapter number 10, verse number 12. In Hosea 10, 12, we read these words. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to come seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Let me just say this. When we talk about God's faithfulness to his promises and, and, and his permanences, uh, permanence of God's commands, the law of, and the permanence of uh, sowing and reaping is found throughout the Bible. And God says, I want you to sow in righteousness so you can reap something better than you're getting right now. Uh, sow yourselves in righteousness so you can reap in mercy. Uh, turn back uh, just a, 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 a two chapters back to chapter number 8 and look at verse number 7. Why did he give that command and why did he give that promise in verse number 12? Because in verse number 7, God said this, For they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. He, he wanted them to change what they were sowing, amen, so they could change what they were receiving. They were sowing to the wind. They're going to reap the world. And God says, stop that. Amen. Sow to yourselves in righteousness so you can reap mercy. And that's what we need. Amen. If you're doing the wrong thing, stop. God says, stop. Realize what you're doing is bringing the, the terrible results and change your ways. That's, I'm fascinated sometimes when, when folks get a little angry, uh, maybe at the preaching and things like that, or the teaching, and they ruffle up a little bit. The, the preaching is not there to hurt. It's just, it's here to say, stop. We've got to stop, or we're going to continue to get 
what we're, the, 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 the ill things that, 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 that our, our sowing is producing. So we want to reap good from God. And so God gave that, that command there. So I, I chose a, a key verse, uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 12. But also in chapter 14, I want you to go there real quickly and see these verses. Uh, chapter 14, verse number 1. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by that iniquity, even after all the unfaithfulness and the many different ways that Hosea is going to detail about their unfaithfulness. God says, return, return. He still offers a way back. It's interesting. In the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, the spirit and the bride say what? Come. The invitation, amen? Even before the end of the age, that, that it, come. What, what should the church be doing right now to sinners? Come. Come to the Lord. Come and see how good God is and come and, uh, come and partake of the forgiveness that Jesus Christ has, has purchased for us with his own shed blood. Uh, that, 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 that invitation to come, return uh, to, the, to the great God. Look at verse number four also. God promises this, I will heal their what? Their backsliding, I will what? I will love them how? Freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. There's a great promise there. I will, I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely. You can't buy God's love, amen? He chooses to love, amen? And he says, take, take advantage of these offers and, 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 and the forgiveness and the mercy that I have for you. So we see some key verses there in, in, in Hosea. Now the key word of Hosea has to be the word return. It's found 15 times in the book. So it, it's, it's a, uh, a book that, 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 that urges the people of God when they're going astray to return. He calls them by many names. A backsliding heifer is one of the names he calls them. Kind of an interesting uh, uh, choice of words. They're very colorful Hosea in his descriptions of things. But a backsliding heifer and uh, cake not Turned and things like that. I mean, he wants them to return uh, and realize their, 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 their poor condition before him. So the key word is return. Some interesting facts as I was uh, doing my research to put the, the notes together for our Bible study tonight. Uh, Hosea, uh, and I hope you find these interesting. If you don't, sorry. Um, but Hosea is believed to have ministered longer than any other prophet. If you look at the timeline, he ministered for about 60 years which is longer than any other prophet had the privilege to minister. And so Hosea uh, lays claim, or we, we, we probably ascribe to him the, uh, the, the privilege of ministering longer than any other prophet in the Bible. Uh, Hosea was the northern, king, northern kingdom of Israel's Jeremiah. And just as uh, Jeremiah wept over Jerusalem, Hosea wept for Israel. And so his tears are recorded in this book. Uh, Hosea uh, not only prophesied of the Assyrian invasion, but he lived to see it take place in 721 B.C. So he had the privilege, like Jeremiah did, amen, of prophesying regarding the Babylonian captivity for uh, Jerusalem and Judah. Uh, uh, Hosea had that same, if you want to call it a privilege, but that same uh, uh, claim to fame, I guess. Uh, he prophesied about Assyria coming in and saw it come to pass. So uh, we, we see that there as well. Hosea is quoted 30 times in the New Testament. That's pretty good. Amen? Many, many times this book is quoted from. So if we're going to understand the New Testament and, and by our study of Hosea, we will understand maybe some of the, the New Testament references uh, that are given in some of the scriptures. Um, you want to take a look at a couple of those tonight? How about we do that? Amen? All right. I need some help reading some verses tonight. Um, who would like to read Matthew 2, verse 15? Brother Bajun, 2, 15. Uh, Norm, Matthew 9, 13. Um, let me write this down so I know who's going where. Who would like to read Luke 23, 30? Brother Reader. All right, Romans 9, 25. Anyone, anyone? Tom? And 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Anyone, anyone? Brother Dave. All right. I want to have, I'm going to have these men read their verses. Uh, I want us to turn to Hosea 11, 1 real quick. Hosea 11, 1. And Brother Bajun, get ready to read Matthew 2, 15. Hosea 11, 1. The Bible says in Hosea 11, 1, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Uh, Brother Bajun, would you read Matthew 2, 15? Matthew 2, 5? 2, 15, I'm sorry. 2, 15. Sorry. Matthew 2, 15. My bad. Matthew 2, 15. So you know what prophet that was. That's Hosea. You can write Hosea in there in that reference in Matthew. That was Hosea. Uh, let's turn to Hosea 6.6. 6. Just thought some of these would be interesting for us tonight. Hosea 6.6. 6. 
I have this verse circled in my Bible. And in Hosea 6, 6, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Brother Norm, would you read Matthew 9, 13? He wanted mercy rather than sacrifice. That was Jesus Christ speaking, true? And he quoted from the prophet Hosea. Uh, let's take a look at Hosea 10, 8. Hosea 10, 8. Hosea 10, verse 8. The Bible says in Hosea 10, 8, The high places also of Avon, uh, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up upon their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, Fall on us. Uh, Brother Ken, would you please read uh, Luke 23, 30? Yes, sir. Cover us. Where did we get that from? Amen. Hosea, prophecy of Hosea. Um, let's go to chapter 2, verse 23 tonight. Hosea 2, 23. We read these words. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. And uh, would you, Tom, would you read Romans 9, 25? So Hosea, O.C. is uh, Greek uh, Hosea, so we see that there. And then for our last one, uh, chapter 13, verse 14. Hosea 13, verse 14. Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Uh, Dave, would you please read 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Amen. Jesus Christ is, is uh, the one that conquered death for us. And so, uh, uh, O death, I'll be thy plagues. O grave, I'll be thy destruction. He's going to put uh, death and the grave down. And we see that great parallel to 1 Corinthians 15, 55. So we see where these are coming from. Some of these quotes in the New Testament are coming from Hosea. So 30 times in the New Testament, we see quotes like that that are ascribed and, 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 and followed back uh, to Hosea's prophecy. Now, uh, number five under interesting facts. Hosea and Gomer's children are named as testimonies against Israel. Uh, their first child, uh, son, was named Jezreel, which means to, to be scattered. Um, God uh, told uh, 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 Hosea when he named him Jezreel, For a little while I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. Jehu slew many people on the plains of Jezreel. Uh, Jehu was used by God to, uh, to take care of Ahab and Jezebel and 70 of their sons and, and many others. And, and for that, he was punished. He was allowed to have, because he did what God asked him to do in the matters of Ahab and Jezebel, he was uh, given uh, four generations to sit on the throne. But after that, his, his lineage would be scattered. So Jezreel's were a lot of the, uh, um, uh, the, the massacring that uh, uh, Jehu was used to perform was carried out. And so now it was coming back upon his head. So Jezreel, uh, again, means to be scattered. So Jehu's seed would be scattered. But not only Jehu's seed would be scattered, but also the northern kingdom would be scattered. When Assyria came in in 721 and conquered Israel, the ten northern tribes, uh, they allowed the people to stay in their land for a little bit of time. But after that, the Assyrians' way was with their conquered people, they would displace them. They would take them out of their homes and relocate them to another part of their kingdom and take people out of another part of the kingdom and reset settle them in, uh, in, 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 I'm stuttering, um, in Israel. And so they would, they would switch the population. And so uh, th this created a problem later on. Uh, we talk about uh, the animosity and the prejudice between uh, the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were intermingled, uh, Jews that had intermingled with the Assyrians and with the Gentiles, and they were not pure Jews anymore. And that's why there was a, a great uh, a prejudice in the New Testament being witnessed between those two people groups. Amen? And the Samaritans were part Jew but also part Gentile, and they had defiled themselves as they were displaced and, and relocated to other parts of the Assyrian kingdom. They lost their heritage, lost their lineage. And that's what caused uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. So, uh, again, to be scattered, Jehu, uh, his seed being scattered, and Israel itself being scattered. Now, the second child that they had was a, was a, a daughter, and her name was Loruhema, and her name meant no more mercy. 
Uh, look at verse number um, uh, 6 of chapter 1. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Leruhamah, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. And so that no more mercy pictured the end of God's long-suffering with Israel. I've said this before, it's not original with me, but when the long-suffering of God ends, the long-suffering of man begins. And so they were going to experience that with the, uh, uh, the, 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 the dispersal and the scattering of, uh, of the entire population. They were going to start experiencing that, uh, that, 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 that forfeiture of God's mercy. And then lastly, the last child that was born was a son. And we see in verse number 8, these words, Now when she had weaned lo Ruhamah, she conceived and bare a son. Then said, God, call his name lo am I, uh, for you're not my people, and I will not be your God. They had stopped being, he had stopped being their God, they had stopped being his people many years before this. Uh, when they started turning their hearts, and, and certainly one of the, the chief sins of Jeroboam when he, when, when he broke away uh, from the two uh, southern tribes was he set up golden calves and uh, convinced the people that th that was indeed their God. The people had been immersed in cultures, uh, cultures surrounding them and cultures they had not eliminated from their, from their, 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 their promise, their, from the promised land. And it was an idolatrous region. And that's why God told them to drive them out utterly. But when they did not do that, the idolatry stayed. And the, I, let me just say this, idolatry is a very strong pull. So said, Pastor Ross, I'm not compelled to go worship a golden calf, but I'll tell you what, there might not be any more golden calves, but I'll tell you what, there's plenty of other idols out there on the landscape today. Pick, you know, take your pick. I mean, the devil's not particular, amen? It could be a golden calf, it could be a car, it could be a house, it could be a job, it could be popularity, it could be prestige, it could be anything, amen? It could be a hobby, anything that we would put before God or allow to steal our affections and attention and devotion away from God is an idol. We are guilty of the sin of idolatry. We're told, actually told in the Bible, uh, and Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, flee idolatry. Run away from it. It's there. Recognize it and run away from it when you, when you recognize it. Amen? And so, uh, the not my people. They stopped following God. They stopped being God's people. And they started worshiping other gods, Baal and Ashtoreth and, and all the other gods that, uh, of the people. Even, we even see this falling away uh, when, when, when Moses and, uh, um, and Joshua went up to get the Ten Commandments. Aaron, I mean, one, of the, one of the big sins, right, even after they got out of Egypt and saw the, the splitting of the Red Sea and, the, and all the great miracles, how God got them out of Egypt, what do they do as soon as Moses goes out of town and goes up on the mount to get the Ten Commandments, what do they do? Hey, we need a God to worship, amen? And they make a golden calf, and Aaron was a piece of work, wasn't he? Well, he just threw the gold in the fire, and I'll pop this golden calf, amen? And the people wanted to work. They, the people told me to make a golden calf. Well, what? Okay, they told you to jump off a bridge. Would you do that too, Aaron? You know, kind of like no logic to his response. And then to say that, you know, they threw the gold in the fire and out popped the golden calf. It doesn't really carry much weight. That's the stupidity of sin, amen? Uh, so they were, you know, that sin would, was going to plague them, amen? And, and it did plague them. Even in Joshua's day, when they got and, and, and they, they started to realize their inheritance of the promised land, Joshua even had to make this declaration, choose you whom this day you'll serve. Or, I mean, uh, uh, he said, but it's for me and my house to serve the Lord. He said, if you want to serve the gods on the other side of the flood or the gods on this side, he said, you've got to make your own choice. He says, but it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So uh, idolatry was even going on then. If you look at the period of the judges, idolatry, idolatry, idolatry. And every time they got engaged in idolatry, God would, ju God would send judgment upon them. They'd whine and cry. Amen. And then the God raised up a judge who would deliver them. And guess what? They go right back into idolatry until the next judge was raised up. And then they go back into idolatry until the next judge was raised up. And that just seemed to be the cyclical pattern of Jewish culture, uh, of God's people. They were always, they were, they were backsliding heifers. They were bent to backsliding. They were bent away from God. What do we need to do? We need to bend ourselves toward God, amen? We need to humble ourselves. And, and that's why I think you know, when we get a chance to pray, we ought to be on our face before God or, or take some posture of humility before God. Why? Because it tells the flesh it's not boss. They say, Pastor, I can't bend my knees. I have a hard time with that too. I understand that. But there ought to be a posture of humility. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said that the, the, the posture of the body affects the attitude of the spirit. Now, he's not a Bible writer and he's not inspired, but I'll tell you what, I think, uh, I think he hit it right on the head with that. Our posture has a lot to do with our, with our attitude, amen? And we ought, to, we ought to humble ourselves before our almighty God. So the last child was called, not my people, amen? Low am I. So everybody can you imagine out the back door, Hosea calling for a shirt, Jezreel! <laughs> and that was just a, just a testimony that there was going to be a scattering taking place, right? He called for uh, uh, Luruama. Luruama, you need to come home. No more mercy. Come home. Hey, not my people. Get in time for dinner, right? 
The, 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 these were visible symbols just as, uh, and I'm trying not to get in my notes, amen, but just was Hosea's entire life. Now let's take a look at the outline of Hosea real quickly. Uh, the outline of Hosea is basically a very simple one. The first three uh, deal primarily, not, not entirely, not exclusively, but with Hosea and Gomer. Uh, uh, and that's in chapters 1 through 3. And then we talk, take a look at the national uh, implications for this uh, between God and Israel. Now, the, the example uh, of Hosea and Gomer is, is, is fitting the greater picture of God and Israel. Hosea is a picture of God being faithful and Gomer being a picture of Israel unfaithful. That makes sense? And so to get the full picture and the full weight of the messages and the prophecy of Hosea, we need to see a little bit about Hosea's uh, personal life and see how that went out. So let's take a look real quickly tonight um, at uh, uh, the grieving husband and the unfaithful wife. Now, uh, letter A, Hosea, by God's command, seeks out and marries a harlot by the name of Gomer. And we saw that in verses 2 and 3. Uh, and, and who commanded him to do that? Can you imagine Hosea trying to explain that to somebody else? You, you, God told you to do what? Well, I know he told you to be a prophet. I mean, I know he called you to be a prophet, but he told you to do what? Amen? What, and let me just say this. What might not make sense to us, if, if it's God's will, it will always work out for his glory in the end. God had a purpose here. And I, I, I'm, I, I, when I read this, and, I just, I, and, and again, just my thoughts toward this, it just would I be surrendered enough to do something like that? Would I be yielded enough for God to say, Bob, well, I'm already married, so I can't really, amen. But, I mean, if God told me to do something that just would be, would I be yielded enough to do something that would be that morally offensive to me or morally repugnant to me? But he was yielded. This, these are questions that, that we, we need to ask. Am I that yielded? Am I that willing to be that used by God? You think about it. Wasn't it the prophet Jeremiah whose wife died and he wasn't allowed to mourn for her? I've thought about it. I, I don't know if I could do that, amen? Uh, you're, while, you're, while you're out preaching to people that don't want to hear your message, your wife's, your wife's home dying, and she's going to die during the night, but then the next morning, you're going to get up like nothing happened. You're not going to be allowed to mourn her. The, the joy of his life, the only one that believed in him, the only one that loved him, because they hated, they hated Jeremiah, amen? And, and in spite of everything that he was, he was hated. And God took away his wife. And one fell swoop and said, you will not mourn for her. God asked the prophets to do some incredible things. Is it any small thing if God would ask us to do something that might be on the pale of our, or might be on the, the borders of our comfort zone? This is one of those examples that just stands out starkly in all the landscape of Scripture and says, hey, look at this. This is what God called this man to do. Take, I know you're my prophet. You've been set apart for a special purpose. You're going to be preaching to Israel, but I want you to go find a harlot. I want you to go find a prostitute. I want you to make her your wife. And, and, and God gave him that command, and so he sought out and married the harlot uh, by the name of Gomer. Now, why was this done? Well, I'll give you some reasons that I, that I think it might have been done. This was done perhaps to help Hosea fully realize the anguish in God's heart over his unfaithful people. Hosea, can, can I say this? Hosea would be a much more effective preacher having gone through this, understanding it personally, how grieved he was. He would be able to understand the grief of God, how how revolted and revolting it was to him to be the husband of a, a woman who was a, 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 a harlot and who went back to uh, prostitution after they were married. He would understand the anguish of watching her leave and knowing what she was up to. Well, and so he'd be better able to preach that message of, uh, of their unfaithfulness and it would burn in his heart a, a lot more uh, deeply than, than just any, well, God, tell, tell my people they're unfaithful. No, you're going to live. You're going to live daily with that unfaithfulness. And when you go out daily, you understand the full weight of the unfaithfulness and how my heart feels. What an incredible thing. What an incredible lesson. What an incredible price he had to pay for that, Hosea did. And what an incredible, incredible price God has had to pay for our unfaithfulness. Amen? So it's done perhaps to help Hosea fully realize the anguish in God's heart over his unfaithful people. Um, uh, number two, uh, God's view of his relationship to Israel is compared to a marriage uh, throughout Scripture, or certainly in these passages here in Isaiah 62.5, Hosea 2.19, and Jeremiah 3.14. His relationship is compared to a marriage. So he wants... He wants Hosea to be able to preach and to understand effectively uh, the, 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 the breaking of that sacred, that sacred oath there uh, by, by Israel. Uh, number three, Hosea would serve as a walking illustration to the people of their own unfaithfulness to a faithful God. 
the, the prostitution that Gomer would engage in after their marriage, everybody that saw Hosea knew what she was up to. And so when he'd be preaching, hey, that's the prophet that, that's got the, the prostitute for a wife. And as he's preaching these messages of unfaithfulness, guess what? And they're coming at him that way. He's saying, you're in the midst of people that are unfaithful. And, and, and that unfaithfulness, and yes, my wife has gone and done this and, and, and broken our marriage vows, but you know what? You've broken your vows with God, and he'd be able to stand out there and proclaim that uh, uh, as an illustration of those people day after day after day. And then lastly, the children are given names, which we, we saw in, uh, uh, in the interesting facts. The children are given names which would describe the future punishment of Israel. Uh, again, uh, to be scattered, no more mercy, and not my people. Now, having said this, Hosea attempts to save his marriage with Gomer, just like God is attempting to salvage his relationship with his people. God's not giving up, and, and Hosea was not to give up either. How did, uh, what attempts did uh, uh, Hosea make to save his marriage with Gomer? Number one, by asking their children to plead and reason with her to examine her ways in return. Look at chapter 2, verse number 1. Say ye to your brethren, am I, and your sisters, uh, Ruhama, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight, uh, and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked, and set her as the day she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children. There's that name coming up again, amen, uh, Loruama. Uh, I will not have mercy upon her children, for they are children of the whoredoms. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that hath conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers and give uh, that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will. Uh, so he, he, he asked his children to go and plead with her. Hey, you're going the wrong. What are you doing? You're going the wrong way. So he asked the children to go and intercede. Uh, and, 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 and by doing that, the children are a picture of the prophets. Are they not? They plead with Israel. Examine your ways. You're, you're going after countries that never did a thing for you. And you're going after people that never provided for you, that didn't nurture you, that, that, that weren't there for you, that did not take a vow to protect you. And so the, 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 the prophets then become the intercessors, do they not? So we see, we see this playing out, amen? So uh, he tried to save the relationship that way by asking the children to plead and reason with her to examine her ways and to return to him. Uh, verse number six, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her path. He tried to bar her from the markets of the world. He tried to put an impediment up there so she wouldn't go that way. Amen? Does not God... Give us a way of escape when the temptations come our way? Does he not try to bar us and, and, and warn us from going astray? Does he not put preachers and teachers and, and faithful Christians in our way that, 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 that warn us and plead with us not to go that way? Sometimes, uh, you know, we, we see that. So, again, by barring her from the markets of the world. And then lastly, and we're going to jump to chapter number three, by buying her out of the markets of the world. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an homer of barley and a half homer of barley. Think about this. What, 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 what is God telling him to do now? He not only told him to take a fallen woman to be his wife, but he told her to go buy her back from the marketplace where she sold herself. That, is not that what God has done with us? He made us. We've gone astray and he had to buy us back. Now, God didn't buy us back for 15 pieces of silver and a, um, a homer of barley and a half homer of barley, a homer and a half of barley. What was the price that he paid to get us back? Oh, my. He had to buy us back from the marketplace of this world, right? Isn't it incredible the picture here? The illustrations are so powerful. They, 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 could not be, they could not be missed. He was leaving Israel without excuse for their, their, their spiritually adulterous ways their spiritual unfaithfulness was in full view every time Hosea stepped up and began to preach they were confronted with it every time they saw one of Hosea's children they were confronted with it every time they saw Gomer they were confronted with it amen and yet God still loved them enough to put some man in their presence to pr proclaim God wants you to return to me this book is just I, I read it and I just I'm astounded with the imagery the illustration, the length that God would go to to get the attention of his people. Amen? God, God must really have loved Israel. 
Amen. God must really love us. Amen. Let's be sensitive. When he says, hey, you're starting to backslide, let's, let's return quickly. Amen. We're going to see that in the, in the chapters that, that come, but I hope we, we, we've brought some things out tonight that will be a help to us. Let, let's not play the part of Gomer. Let, 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 let's be faithful to our God. Let's, let, let's, let, let's not, let, let's, when God says in 1 John uh, not to be friends with the world, right? That's flirting with the world. That's giving our affections to the world that's never loved us, that's never done a blessed thing for us but hurt us. Let's keep our hearts pure. The first commandment, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. There should be, just as there should be no question in the heart of a husband or wife about the love of their spouse, there should be no question in the heart of the mind of God regarding our dedication, devotion, and faithfulness to Him. Amen? This book is that stark reminder that it can happen to God's people. And, and, and a warning to us that we should not let it happen to us. Amen? It's an incredible book. We're going to take a look as we go, uh, Lord willing. Uh, if not, we'll just catch up with Hosea in heaven and ask him to explain a little more fully. Amen? I don't know what you're going to be doing for eternity. I'm going to be looking these guys up. Amen? just want to get a little better Bible study on some of these things. Amen? But uh, uh, what an incredible... Hosea is going to shine like the brightness of the stars forever. Amen? Just because... I uh, really be just because of all that God asked him to go through. Something special for him. But... Uh, we're going to take a look, if the Lord wills, uh, next Wednesday night we'll, take, we'll begin taking a look at chapters 4 and seeing the, the way that Israel, the nation, became, w w played out the unfaithfulness to their faithful God. So uh, you come back next week and we'll start our uh, uh, second part of the outline, the national aspect of, of Hosea's writing between God, the faithful God, and unfaithful Israel.